In this mini lecture, we're going to talk about exponential step and impulse signals. Now, why do we consider these signals? Well, they're very useful models for different sorts of physical phenomena. So exponentials are useful in representing decay or growth, while steps help us model sudden changes, such as flipping a switch. And then impulses give us a model for a perturbation, or sort of the, uh, the kind of signal where we would kick the tires of a car in the old uh, ad, you know, give a, a sudden perturbation and see what happens. So we're going to start off looking at exponentials, then we'll combine exponentials with sinusoids, look at exponentially damped sinusoids, uh, give an example of exponentially damped sinusoidal behavior for a guitar playing a note, then we'll quickly introduce steps and impulses. A continuous time exponential takes the form of x of t equals a e raised to the negative b t power. Sometimes we can write that in longhand using the exp notation instead of just the uh, exponential. The shape of the signal depends on the value of b. If b is greater than zero, we end up having a signal that decays with time. And actually, the rate of decay depends on how big b is. If b is a number that is close to zero, in other words, it's slightly positive, then the decay is fairly slow, where if b is a large number, the decay will be much faster. If, on the other hand, if b ends up being a negative, so then in the exponent we have a positive term as t increases, then we have a growing phenomena, a growing exponential. Okay, and again, the rate of growth on this is going to depend on the value of b. The more negative b is, the faster this is going to grow. Now in discrete time, we get a similar behavior. In this case, we can think of a discrete time exponential x of n. Uh, for analogy with the continuous time case, we could write it as a e to the negative b n. However, it's common in notation to replace e to the negative b with alpha, and then we can describe the discrete time exponential as a alpha to the n. We usually write it this way, and underneath you can see that it is the same sort of signal as a continuous time exponential. But in this case, we're going to characterize how it behaves in terms of alpha. So if alpha is a number between 0 and 1, then alpha to the n decays or decreases as n increases, and we get this sort of exponentially uh, decreasing sequence. On the other hand, if alpha is greater than 1, we get an exponentially increasing sequence because I'm raising a, a number that's greater than 1 to powers. So if alpha were 2, for example, then every time I incremented n, I would basically double the value of x of n. And you can see that's going to blow off fairly quickly. Now we can get an exponentially damped sinusoid by multiplying a sinusoid times one of these exponential signals. So as I've shown here, I've got x of t is equal to a e to the negative b t times cosine omega naught t. And if I were to graph that, you can see that I have the sinusoidal oscillatory behavior, but there's an exponential uh, decay, in this case because b is greater than zero, on top of that sinusoid. We get the same sort of thing if we go to the discrete time case, where I'm going to write it as a alpha raised to the nth power times cosine of omega naught n. Again, we get the oscillatory behavior associated with, say, a cosine in this case, although it has an envelope or a damping factor that looks like an exponential. And of course, you can get variations on this. We can use a sine function instead of a cosine. We can consider alpha greater than 1 or b less than 0 to get growing damped sinusoids. So we're going to look at an example of a signal like this that occurs in the real world by what happens when we pluck a guitar string. And so we're first we're going to look at the envelope of how that sound decays, and we'll fit that with some exponentials, and we'll see what happens then if we uh, use some exponentials to approximate that uh, note with a damp sinusoid. So in the top panel of this graph, I'm showing a guitar playing the note G. 
The blue represents the sound created by the guitar, and you can see that the note was plucked at approximately a half second. And if we zoom in on a section of this note from around two seconds, you can see the fine structure in the lower panel of this note. Looks sort of periodic. We know it's not exactly periodic because it has this decay on it, but over short intervals it looks periodic. Now the other thing I'm showing in the top panel is what I'm calling the envelope of this note, which we're approximating with this red curve. Now I obtained that red curve by taking the magnitude of this signal and then smoothing out the fluctuations in the magnitude. And then you can see the fact that it's smoothed here by noting that it doesn't exactly follow all the fine structure in the guitar note. But nevertheless, it's, it should be sufficient for our purposes here. Now I'm going to play that sound for you. Okay, we'll do that again. Okay, so that's the note G being played by the guitar. Now what I'm showing in this graph is taking that note, which now is depicted by the green signal, I'm going to take that note and I'm going to fit some exponentials to its envelope. And what I noticed when trying this is that actually um, one exponential doesn't really describe the behavior over the entire duration of the note. It turns out that the decay is a bit steeper in the first portion and then the decay kind of tapers off more slowly in the second portion. So what I did was I fit the envelope of this signal using two different exponentials. So the decay in this first exponential is greater, and then the decay is more gradual in the second exponential. So the combination of these two does a pretty good job of describing how the amplitude decays. So in this graph, I've synthesized a note G by taking a sinusoid and applying those exponential damped behavior to that sinusoid. So in the top panel, I'm showing the synthetic note that I created using a sinusoid by applying my exponential envelope to that sinusoid. And then we'll zoom in on the section around two seconds in the middle panel. And just for reference, you can see the original note from the guitar in that interval in the bottom panel. And the amplitude's right, and it's about the same period. Uh, the fine structure is not present because we're only using a single sinusoid. If I were to use additional harmonics, as we showed with the saxophone note in a previous lecture, then I could do a better job of just capturing the fine structure. So let's listen to this now. That's the original note by the guitar. Here's my synthetic one. So the synthetic note doesn't have all the structure, the rich harmonic structure, and hence doesn't sound quite like a guitar. And again, if we were to add additional harmonics in, we could get a, do a better job of approximating the original guitar note. So let's talk next about steps. And here I've given the equation for a step, let's call it S of n, and it says that before time zero, before n equals zero, the value of this signal is zero, and then for n greater than or equal to zero, the value is one. So there's a sudden change that occurs at n equals zero. And I've graphed that signal down here in the bottom left. You can see it's zero, and then at time zero, it jumps up to one. Now the continuous time version of this is similar although uh, it has a discontinuity at zero, and we have s of t is defined as zero for t less than zero, and one for t greater than zero. So the limit as you approach zero from the left is different than the limit as you approach zero from the right. It's as if someone flipped a switch and instantaneously the value of the signal jumps up to have unity. Okay, and we can scale the size of this jump by putting a constant in front of these signals. So this represents a sudden change. Now impulses represent perturbation. And again, the discrete time case is very easy to define. The discrete time impulse, which we'll denote by delta of n, is exactly zero when n is not equal to zero, and it'll be one when n is equal to zero. 
So that gives us this kind of a graph. This signal is 0, 0, 0, 0, boom, sudden perturbation, and then 0, 0, 0, 0 thereafter. Now it's a bit more tricky to define an impulse in continuous time because we have to worry about things being continuous, but the way that an impulse is defined in continuous time is in terms of a pair of equations. First of all, we're going to say delta of t is our impulse, and that that impulse is zero for all times not equal to zero. So you know we haven't specified what happens at t equals zero. But we do specify that the area under this signal be exactly one. So this represents a signal that's zero everywhere, and then except t equals zero, and then to get uh, unit area, it must be really big at t equals zero. So we usually draw this as shown here by an upward facing arrow, and oftentimes uh, we'll put a, a symbol next to the arrow, like the one that's shown here, to indicate that the area under this impulse is unity. If I put some other number here, like if it were 10, then that would indicate that the area under this impulse is 10. So continuous time impulses are known as generalized functions. And they have some unique properties. They're infinitesimally wide and effectively infinitely tall. And we can think about that in terms of a rectangular function that has unit area. As I've drawn here, calling this f sub delta of t, where capital delta is related to the width of this rectangular function. So it turns on at minus delta, goes up to an amplitude of 1 over 2 delta, and then turns off at delta. So this function has width 2 delta, height 1 over 2 delta, and therefore has unit area. And we can visualize an impulse as the limiting case as the width goes to 0 of this function. And that gives us a sequence of taller and taller, narrower and narrower rectangles. And the limit, as the width goes to 0, we have our impulse. Now, a mathematician would only write the impulse function in continuous time underneath an integral sign, because that's really the only place it's truly meaningful, as engineers oftentimes were not quite so precise in how we use them, and, and uh, usually that works out fine. Now, one very important property of the continuous time impulse is the so-called sifting property. That is, if I integrate some function f of t against an impulse whose lo which is located at t0, so in this case the impulse is going to be on at time t0 and it's 0 everywhere else, if I integrate this product, I pick out the value of the function at t0. We've looked at exponential signals. Those are capable of representing natural growth or decay phenomena. We can exponentially damp sinusoids, and in that case we get growing or damp or decaying oscillatory behavior. Steps are signals that allow us to represent switching behavior, and then impulses give us this idea of having a perturbation.